Exodus 21, 22 through 25. When men get in a fight and hit a pregnant woman so that her children are born prematurely, but there is no injury, the one who hit her must be fined as the woman's husband demands from him. And he must pay according to the judicial assessment. If there is injury, then you must give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. May Yahweh bless His Word to our hearts today. And may we receive this for what it is, not the Word of man, but the Word of Yahweh. There's been a ton of discussion about this law throughout history. It continues today among scholars and among people in general. It is popular because it deals with a pregnant woman. So there's something in particular here about a baby or a life that is growing inside of the woman. So this law, as you can probably see, has made its way into the big abortion debate in modern times. Discussions on this text often stem from some terms that could be understood in more than one way. Where the HCSB says when men get in a fight and hit a pregnant woman so that her children are born prematurely, if you're reading that version of the Bible, the word prematurely is in brackets. That indicates that it's an addition to the English text of the Bible. It's not found in the Hebrew. There's a footnote in the HCSB that reads either a live birth or a miscarriage. So it could go either way. The New Revised Standard Version reads, When people who are fighting injure a pregnant woman so that there is a miscarriage. The Old King James Version reads, When men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart. You've heard of fruit of the womb. That's what that's talking about. The Hebrew words here are yeled, which means children or offspring or fruit, and yatzah, which means to exit or to go out. So, literally, it's her child goes out or her children exits. So, is it a live birth or is it a miscarriage? Well, it could be either. The text does not specify. And that's a big reason for the back and forth discussion and debate on the text. Another point that causes discussion is from verse 23 where it says, If there is an injury, was that referring to the woman being injured? or what's inside the woman being injured. Scholars go back and forth on this. And then, of course, at the bottom, you have the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth precept that many Christians think Yeshua overturned in Matthew chapter 5, that we no longer go by eye for eye and tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So that makes for a big discussion and debate. So there's a lot, there's a ton that's going on in this text, a whole bunch. And I plan on getting into the intricate details of this particular text in my next lesson next week. This week, I thought it would be best to lay some groundwork and get a foundation as to why I believe that life begins inside the womb of a woman and not at first breath outside the womb of a woman. I'll start with what I call the common sense argument. I saw a video the other day where a husband and a wife announced their first pregnancy to the man's mother. And his synopsis went in writing that he and his wife had been married for five plus years, had not had any children, kind of put that off. Not that they couldn't have children, but just hadn't really tried to have children. And so his mom, like a lot of moms do, asked, when are you going to have me a grandbaby? And after a while, he said that she kind of stopped asking that. When they got pregnant, they decided to tell her in a special way about their pregnancy. Uh, check this out right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. 
just tell you, I just watched these two movies. Oh, how cute, they have a theme. <laughs> Does it mean that seriously? No, sir. Are you serious? No, sir. <laughs> Are you serious or not? This is not funny, you know. I'm not laughing at you. Are you serious? <laughs> so it's heartwarming there in that couple minutes. Um, this young pregnant woman, the daughter-in-law of this uh, lady here, she wasn't showing, else the new grandma would have already known, right? Uh, it's early into her pregnancy. I think I read somewhere that she was like 13 weeks pregnant when they decided to tell her through this game of Scrabble. Why did the lady get emotional? Because a pregnancy announcement meant what? There was a baby that was going to be coming into the family. Her son and her daughter-in-law were going to have a baby and make her a grandma for the first time. The pregnancy meant that a new life was in the making. I want to argue that not only does this woman here know that, but everybody knows that. This is why women do certain special things when they're pregnant. They don't eat or drink some things and they do eat or drink other things. And as time progresses and the woman gets into her second and third trimester, maybe the dad lays down beside the stomach of the woman and he sings or he reads to the little baby that's still inside of mama's womb. I remember I did that to my children um, as my wife progressed in her pregnancy. We do these things because we recognize there's a little life that's forming gradually inside of the lady. And it's not just Jewish people or Islamic people or Christians or spiritual people that recognize this. Unbelievers recognize this too. That's why you sometimes see people announce their pregnancy and they have an atheist or a pro-choice friend or acquaintance that will congratulate them on their pregnancy. Oh, I'm so excited you're pregnant. Why do they congratulate? Because they know it means a baby is being formed. Everybody in the world knows this. Did anybody else here have a grandmama or a mama when you were growing up, who baked cakes. And when, you, when they were baking cakes, they said, Matthew, don't you be hollering or stomping around the house. I don't want my cake to fall. Some people say that's a myth, that you can't really have a cake fall by doing that. But all I know is I knew when Grandmama was baking a cake and put it in the oven, I had to tiptoe if I walked through the kitchen because she would get on to me. The reason that she did this was because when the cake was in the oven, it wasn't fully formed or ready to eat, but it's, it's a process, right? It's a process. So what if, let's say, before she put the batter in the oven formed, let's say she put all the ingredients in the bowl, she mixed it all together in the bowl, got it real good and everything, and I walked through the kitchen as a little 10-year-old boy, let's say. Let's say I stuck my hand <coughs> into the bowl, got some of the batter out, and threw it on the floor. What do you think Grandmama would do? Hickory switch, right. So she would say, why did you destroy, why did you mess my cake up? Even though the cake was still in the process of being formed, she called it a cake, she recognized what I did to it, destroyed the cake. That is an illustration, but the point is that you can mess up the cake before it's ready. It's not fully ready until, sure, it's out of the oven, cooled down, you put the icing on it, but the making and the baking process is key to the cake. Some children are born premature. They didn't get it to spend all the time that they needed in the oven, in the womb of their mama. This chart right here is my little nephew named Hollis. My sister birthed him when he was 28 weeks gestation. Uh, and she told me she named him Hollis. I'm big on the meaning of names, big on it. All my children are named what they're named specifically for a reason. I looked up Hollis and it meant like, like a holly bush strong. Uh, like you don't want to get too close to holly bush because it'll stick you, right? It withstands things. And I told my sister that and she said, I needed to hear that, Matthew. She didn't realize that it was had that meaning at the time. She was distraught. 
We were all distraught. We visited him as a little bitty baby in the hospital. You see him, that's an actual picture of Hollis when he was newborn. And like his whole hand was the size of the tip of my thumb. You know, I can't remember how many pounds and ounces he was, but it probably was around maybe one or two pounds, something like that. You could hold him. I think there's a picture maybe of my dad or my brother-in-law holding in, in the hand that little baby. Nobody was certain that he would make it, and this happens all the time. Babies are born what they call preemie or premature. And thanks to the aid of modern technology in, in medicine and in hospitals, a lot of these little babies survive even though they're born preemie. Um, the picture on the right, he's seven years old now. He's doing great. And uh, he loves me, and I love him. Little Hollis, he's my buddy. Um, I posted something in regards to this sermon on Facebook a day or two, and I had a few comments that came up. One of the ladies on Facebook said that she had a grandson that was born January 19th, 2023, so just recently, and her grandson is now two weeks old. He's doing well. He was born 26 weeks gestation. 26 weeks. They were able to save that little baby. Another sister came on there and she said, My daughter was born preemie back in 1978. She weighed 2 pounds and 13 ounces when she was born. And they were able to save her life in 1978. She said, Now my daughter is 45. She has seven children and they're a Torah observant family. Oh, hallelujah. That blessed my heart. Now, it is also the case that some children are born preemie and they do not make it. And that is very, very sad. I cannot imagine going through that as a, as a dad or as a mom. I had one lady comment this. A friend of mine had a stillbirth at 21 weeks. I went to the hospital to visit and actually got to hold her sweet baby girl. She was very small, but completely formed. We could easily see that she looked just like her older brother. Same nose, the same eyes, and even the same hair color. And funny enough, the same long toes. She looked exactly like a full-term newborn would normally look. Just much, much smaller. I really don't understand how anyone can't see it. It has to be that they just don't want to see it. And that is so sad. I agree with this sister right here. I think it's because people don't want to see it. All of what I've went over so far is what I call the common sense argument for life beginning inside the womb rather than outside the womb. And I really think that a common sense argument is a Yahweh argument. <laughs> because Yahweh gives us a mind and a heart to think and reason and use logic. I haven't really used Holy Scripture yet to show this, but is there evidence in the Bible showing that what I've presented as common sense is reality is true? Let's look at a few scriptures on this. The first one is Genesis chapter 25, 19 through 23. It says, These are the family records of Isaac, son of Abraham. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took as his wife Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padanaram and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to Yahweh on behalf of his wife because she was barren. <coughs> Yahweh heard his prayer. And his wife, Rebecca, conceived. I mean, believe Yahweh hears prayers. <laughs> it's a great example right here. He prayed. Yahweh listened. He heard. And he answered Isaac's prayer. Ooh, that's beautiful. That's good. But the children, catch this, but the children inside her struggled with each other. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of Yahweh. And Yahweh said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One will be stronger than the other. And the older will serve the younger. Isaac prays for Rebekah's barren womb. Yahweh hears and answers the prayer. Rebekah conceives. She gets pregnant. And what is growing inside of her is called children in verse 22. Children are inside your womb. Yahweh calls them nations and people in verse 23. Just like grandmama would say, why did you mess up my cake, even though it wasn't finished baking? We aren't told how far along Rebecca's pregnancy was in this text. But what we do know for sure is that the word children, nations, and people were applied to the developing offspring of Isaac and Rebecca. That proves that life begins 
inside the womb and not at first breath outside the womb. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. Here we have another account of a barren woman, but this time she's not a younger woman that could get pregnant. She's an older woman that not normally would get pregnant. Her name is Elizabeth, and her husband's name is Zechariah. Luke 1 verses 7 and 18 tell us that they were both old or advanced in years, well along in days. They're both Levites. And they're righteous. Luke 1, 5-6 says that Zechariah and Elizabeth were both righteous, comma, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of Yahweh, blameless. Good verse to use if somebody tells you that you can't keep the commandments. Tell them what about Zechariah and Elizabeth. That phrase is not used for somebody that just went about their life breaking commandments. <laughs> that meant everybody who knew Zechariah and Elizabeth knew that's a righteous old man and old woman. They've served Yahweh and they're dedicated to Yahweh. Zechariah is a priest, and one day while he's serving in the temple, there was an angel that comes to visit him, and he's startled, because when angels show up, it startles you. <laughs> the angel tells him some things in verses 13 through 15 of Luke chapter 1. It says, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. And Zechariah must have been praying that he would have a son. Maybe he hadn't had one at this point. He says, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will name him Yohanan. We say John. Yohanan to Johan to Jan and then to John. <laughs> but what they would have called him was Yohanan, which means Yahweh is gracious. You name him Yahweh is gracious. There will be joy and delight for you and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of Yahweh and will never drink wine or beer. Most likely, Yohanan was a, he took the vow of Nazir from birth, a Nazarite vow, Numbers chapter 6. Here's the key part. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. That proves that Hebrews viewed life beginning inside the womb rather than outside the womb. And not only that, but this is an angel that's commissioned by Yahweh who spoke these words to Zechariah. So this is Yahweh speaking and saying, life begins inside of the womb. Verses 24 through 25 in Luke 1 say this, After these days his wife Elizabeth conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. And she said, Yahweh has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. Notice in verse 26, it begins by saying in the sixth month. And then it goes on to speak of another woman getting pregnant named Miriam or Mary, Maria, some people say, the mother of our master. That sixth month in verse 26, that's not the sixth month of the year. Some people I've talked to when they try to calculate the birth of Christ, they'll try to say that Mary conceived in the sixth month of the year based on Luke 1.26. It's not good hermeneutics. Notice verse 24 and 25 mentions Elizabeth hid herself in seclusion for five months. Verse 26, in the sixth month. It's talking about the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. It could be any time during the year. That's the flow of the context there. You'll see another verse that proves this as well. In verses 36 through 37, Gabriel is now announcing another birth, another miraculous birth to a virgin who was betrothed to a man named Yosef, but they had not came together yet, and the virgin's name was Mary. And Mary doesn't doubt. She just says, how can this be, seeing I've never been intimate with a man? And, and the angel Gabriel says, Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, that which is born in you will be called the Son of God, the Son of Elohim. And then Mary says, so be it unto me according to thy word. And in verse 36 through 37 Gabriel continues and says, Consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month. There's that sixth month again. This is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with the Almighty. That's an allusion back to Genesis 18 when there was another old woman. We went over it in our Bible study today. Some of y'all know her. Sarah. The angel told her, 
when she laughed because she was 90 years old, the angel said, it's going to happen for nothing is impossible with the Almighty. Gabriel, might have been the same angel. Gabriel says it right here. Nothing shall be impossible with the Almighty. Two miraculous births in Luke 1. One was a young virgin woman that had never been intimate with a man. The other one was a woman that was past the age of childbearing, old Elizabeth. But she was so thankful Yahweh took away her disgrace and she, she got to have this, this joy happen in the latter portion of her life. What happens next here, building up to something, what happens next here in verses 39 through 45 is Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. Mary is newly pregnant and Elizabeth is six months into this thing. So Elizabeth's showing, right? Elizabeth's showing. She's got the baby bump, maybe a little bit more than a baby bump. Okay? When Mary gets there at, to the door of Elizabeth's house, she greets her relative Elizabeth and the text says that the baby inside of Elizabeth leaps in the womb of Elizabeth. It's because sometimes when we get the Holy Spirit, we get excited and we leap for joy. That's okay. There's scripture on that, right? I don't believe in doing stuff that ain't, there ain't scripture on. But if it's scripture on it, I'm fine with it. Sometimes I get excited in Yahweh and I begin to leap for joy. I begin to leap for joy. It's, it's in the Psalms. He is leaping because two reasons. One, that little baby recognizes that the woman that came to visit is the mother of the promised Messiah. And two, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. By the end of a woman's six month of pregnancy, her baby is about 12 inches long and two pounds. The baby's skin is still translucent, but the finger and the toe prints are visible. And some baby's eyes even begin to open at this time. So this little six-month gestation baby is not done cooking in mama's oven, but it's still seen as a person by the Almighty who filled that six-month gestation Yohanan with His Holy Spirit. Now catch this. Why did Yohanan leap in his mother's womb? Luke 1, 41-42 says, When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside of her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then she exclaimed with a loud cry. This is a prophecy. Elizabeth was a prophetess. She prophesies and she says, You are the most blessed of women, talking to Mary, and your child will be blessed. Mary's just now conceived. Elizabeth said, Your child will be blessed. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, pronounces a blessing upon Mary and her child. Even though Mary had just gotten pregnant. Elizabeth is six months pregnant. Miriam just received her news from the angel in Luke 1, 26 and 36. So she's just days or weeks into this. It's possible, the text doesn't tell us, but it's possible that Mary got pregnant at the beginning of Elizabeth's six month of pregnancy and went to visit her mid or the end of Elizabeth's six month of pregnancy. So not only is Yohanan considered a child in the womb at six months gestation, Yeshua, at the most at four weeks gestation, is considered a child. At four weeks, that little baby is only about the size of a poppy seed, yet still it's recognized as a child that a blessing can prophetically be pronounced upon. That's a powerful point, brothers and sisters. Look at Psalm 139, 13 through 16. I wrote a song based on this psalm before my first grandchild was born, Bowen Lee. Psalm 139, 13, it says, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. If you study that phrase, depths of the earth, it's referring to the hidden place inside of a woman as the depths of the earth, kind of like a hidden place in a mountain or something like that. Verse 16, Your eyes saw me when I was formless. Poppy seed. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. The psalmist sees a recognition here of his days on the earth being planned. That's a reference to life outside of the womb. But he also recognizes the forming of the child inside the mother's womb. 
He says, the Almighty saw me when I was formless. Yahweh creates our bones, our stiff, hard bones inside of our mama's womb. <laughs> Meditate on that. That's a, that's a miracle. It's wonderful. So remember, when you talk to people about this, remember Genesis 25, where Jacob and Esau are called children inside of their mama's womb. Remember Luke 1, where six-month gestation, John the baptizer, as he's later called, leaps inside of his mama's womb. And also where Elizabeth prophesies a blessing on Mary and her child, even though the child's at the most four weeks gestation. And then remember Psalm 139, 13 through 16. All of these texts teach that what takes place inside of the womb of a pregnant woman is life. And I believe the same holds true for Exodus 21, 22 through 25. It shows that when men get in a fight and hit a pregnant woman so that her child exits, there's a penalty for causing damage to not just the mother but also the child. I don't think that the woman being pregnant would even be mentioned in the text if it's not vital to the understanding of that particular law. There is a penalty for causing damage to both the mom and the baby. Scripture treats a developing life as just that. A human being that is developing and forming and getting ready to enter into the world at its appointed time. And recognize that damage done to a pregnant woman can be damage on both the woman and the developing child. And recognize that this damage in this text we might term accidental damage. Men are fighting and a pregnant woman's around. Some commentators say it could be a pregnant woman of one, a wife of one of the men that's fighting. It's not necessary though. It could just be a pregnant woman in the midst. She gets hit. There's no intention, but the damage that's done to her or the child must be compensated for. That's the point of Yahweh's law. That lets us know if we're doing something that could cause somebody damage, even if we don't intend to damage something, if we do by acting the fool, we have to pay for what we did. This is case law. It's not just for this case, but it's case law that applies to several different situations in life. As I close, if a child can be filled with the Holy Spirit at six months gestation, what happens when you harm the life of a child at six months gestation? Something to think about. Next week, I'll dissect the text in Exodus 21, 22 through 25. We'll go verse by verse, sometimes word by word. We'll look at some intricate things and we'll get into more detail about Yahweh's law that truly is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For now, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall think on it day and night. Be careful to do what Yah tells you to do so that you will have good success. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left, but stay on the narrow path. Be careful to do what Yah tells you to do so that you will have good success. I love everybody. May Yahweh bless you.